Hello, I'm Amanda Thomas, and you are listening to A Scientist Walks Into a Bar. This podcast features recordings of talks given at Science on Tap, a series of science lectures held in Portland, Oregon, and Vancouver, Washington. In this episode, we will hear from Dr. Randy Hutter Epstein, who is a medical writer and lecturer at Yale University. And she's talking about her book, Aroused, The History of Hormones and How They Control Just About Everything. This was recorded in July 2018 in Portland as part of Randy's book tour. Aroused was included in the list of favorite science books of 2018 by Science News, and the paperback comes out in June 2019, so you should definitely go check it out. A few notes about the episode. First, if you come to one of our events, you'll get to experience that we usually do a trivia game with questions about the night's topic at the beginning of each talk as a fun way to get things started. However, it doesn't make great audio for a podcast, so we don't include the trivia in these episodes. However, Randy mentions the trivia a couple of times, and I wanted you all to have an idea what she was talking about. The second thing is that we play audio from a video that was produced by two of her students, Jessica Pevner and Catherine McGeeck. Just wanted to acknowledge them and say thank you for letting us use it in this episode. The video is pretty charming, and I'll put a link to it in the episode description. Finally, Randy sets up an excellent punchline for the finish of the talk, but unfortunately, it just showed up on the screen and she didn't actually say it into the microphone. I wanted to keep the final story in there, so you'll hear me jump in at the end to tell you what was on the slide. With that, let's get started. So, I want to just begin with one of the trivia things. Who here, you don't have to raise your hand, but just think about it, who here got the one wrong about where the word hormone comes from? Because I would not have named my book to begin a process. I named it Aroused. That was a trick question. That was like a giveaway. I didn't name my book, you know, whatever the other ones, Instigate. So anyhow, with that, I really want to talk, I want to begin this by giving, telling a story about my grandma. When I was a kid in Yonkers, which is a suburb north of New York City in the 1960s, I spent a lot of summers with my siblings going to my grandma's pool club. My grandmother and her three friends would sit at a table in the shade, smoking Kent cigarettes, drinking coffee, and playing canasta. My sister and I would play in the pool, but we were determined to get tan. So we did what everyone did in the 1960s. You took an album cover, if you remember what album covers look like, and we put aluminum foil around it and then put our chins in it. And then, which probably wasn't the best idea given the color of my skin, I bathed in in baby oil just to make sure that I would sizzle. You can probably tell that I would burn to a crisp and then just go back to my normal pail the next day. Um, My sister always got this lovely bronze. But here's the thing. Grandma Martha, despite being under a canopy hidden from the sun, had the most gorgeous copper color. We were mystified and yet also a bit envious. It wasn't until years later that we learned that Grandma Martha didn't have an enviable aptitude for sunbathing. She had a hormone ailment, Addison's disease. Her body didn't produce enough cortisol. That's a hormone that helps maintain blood pressure and strengthens the immune system. Cortisol is also a stress hormone. People with Addison's disease suffer from extreme fatigue, nausea, and low blood pressure. The disease also darkens the skin. When I was a kid, I didn't know much about her disease, except that it was the same thing that John F. Kennedy had, which made it a very presidential thing to catch. (laughs) My mother throughout my life, or I remember my mom throughout my life, just saying, Ma, to her own mother, don't forget to take your cortisone pill. There was one in the morning and one in the afternoon. I'm not even sure I knew that Addison's disease was a hormone disease. To me, hormones were boobs and periods and sex. But hormones are so much more. They're potent chemicals that control metabolism, behavior, sleep, mood, and the immune system. 
When I delved into the history of hormones, I wasn't thinking about my family history. I delved into the history of hormones because the last century has been a period of incredible discovery and also outrageous claims. Consider this, it's pretty remarkable. When Grandma Martha was born in 1900, the word hormone didn't exist. By the time she was diagnosed in the 1970s, scientists had a way to spot her hormone defect. They could measure her hormones down to the billionth of a gram. I'm not a numbers person. And you know, throughout the book, I kept telling my husband, who's not a science person, um, and he's the numbers guy, like, wow, listen to this fact. Wow, you're not gonna believe this. And when I said to him, wow, you're not gonna believe, like they could then, they figured out how to measure hormones down to the billionth of a gram. He's like, I don't think you mean billionth. No, actually he was wrong. I do mean billionth with a B. That's like for those of you who don't know numbers the way I do, picture like a one grain of salt being tossed into the ocean and yet it has a huge impact. I'm going to be telling you about the woman that you heard about in the trivia. I'm gonna tell you about her and how she devised that technique. Just like Grandma Martha, she was a woman from New York City in the middle years of the 20th century who also doted on her kids and they both made home-cooked meals. Unlike Grandma, she got a Nobel Prize and revolutionized modern medicine. <laughs> but I'm getting ahead of myself. Two things. Um, one is grandma liked gin and tonic, so you can add that to your list. Manhattan, because I'm from Manhattan, or gin and tonic, feel free to get one. Um, also, I found this out after I wrote the book. Um, someone contacted me to say that he knows, and I'm gonna get in touch with this guy, he knows the doctor that was given JFK's blood to do the blood test to figure out what was wrong with him. Um, but in those days, you know, unlike when now we see like our president's colonoscopies and whatnot, you know, on the front page of the New York Times, um, in those days we didn't discuss our president's ailments. So this young doctor had just become an endocrinologist. Someone came to him, he was in Washington, D.C., and said, run these tests, we need to know, we think there's a hormone thing going on. Um, and he said, well, you know, I need to know a little bit about the patient, name, age, where he's from. No, we're not, we'll tell you he's 37, it was, um, but we can't tell you anything more. And we can't, it's secret service, you're gonna run the test, you're not gonna know anything about the patient, you're not gonna know anything, just let us know what he has. So that's how his um, Addison's was discovered by this young doctor. And there's still been controversy over whether um, he had Addison's or some polyhormonal thing. He was put on tons of steroids. They didn't have the cortisone pills quite yet that my grandma got. So a lot of the high dose of the steroids were what hurt his back. He ended up having back surgery, probably from being overdosed from the steroids. A 92-year-old doctor just contacted me recently. I'm gonna be meeting him next week in New York City. And he told me that um, while he thought after the fact that JFK did a good job, he really hated him during the election. So he wrote a letter, and I haven't found this letter yet, but I want to, because I just found this out. He said, this doctor told me, he wrote a letter to the New York Times as an esteemed endocrinologist saying that someone with Addison's disease is not fit to be president. But he said, I just wrote it because I hated him for other reasons, but thought <laughs> he could have sway. They published his letter in the New York Times, and I really want to find it. Um, but it didn't, it didn't sway the election. And then he said he was glad after the fact. So, hormones. Before we continue, we should know what hormones are. I feel bad, because I'm gonna ask a question, but I don't have prizes. So if you answer this question right, I guess just find me after and I'll buy you a drink, because I don't have those fun things that were on the slide. Um, you know, the, think about this, because we take hormones for granted. The cool thing about hormones is like there's so many different glands, like the pituitary, pancreas, ovary, testy, and then there's just a gazillion hormones, like ones you've never heard of, like obscure names, but you've also have testosterone, growth hormone, insulin, ACTH, all these hormones, and you wouldn't think they'd be together in one field. And it used to be that they weren't, the, that the adrenal people didn't talk to the testes people, who didn't talk to the ovary people, and, it, and if you had told them, no, like, just be one field, 
it would have been as if you were saying like to neurosurgeons and dentists, okay, you guys, like you have the same thing. But there is one simple unifying fact that makes a hormone a hormone. Um, does anyone know? And I can't really see anyone. So does anyone want to shout out the definition of a hormone or try? Oh, there, now I can see you. Thank you. Um, hmm? Signaling. Signaling is part, yeah. Neurotransmitter, secreted. Yeah, so we're getting like random things. The definition is, um, I'll, I'll drink to that. A hormone is a chemical secreted from one gland and goes to a faraway target. So not like here to New York City, but far away from a, from a tiny billionth of a gram point of view from like head to testy. So if we think of that like grain of salt thing, that's far. It also doesn't seem that miraculous now. And that's why I always, like, I have this, hor this metaphor that I love, you know, that hormones are like your internal Wi-Fi. And I love it because, like, I can't turn on my television and I actually have no concept of Wi-Fi or internet. But I do know that when I send an email, it's going to get to the person who's supposed to get it I mean, I, not a lot of people, other people probably see it, but they're not supposed to. But in, in the ideal world, in the ideal world, you can send an email to someone and no one else sees it. And it doesn't march along a road. It kind of goes there from some magical way with routers and whatever. And that's how hormones work. So if you have a hormone in your, like the way, if, if think about it this way, before we understood hormones, the thinking was that everything in the body had to travel along nerves, it had to be attached. And even when these guys came up with the concept, there were doctors saying, or scientists, like there must be tiny nerves, you just didn't see them. Like the fact that something could just travel, and if they didn't go through air, they go through the blood. So you could say, well, oxygen goes through the blood, but oxygen is like if you picture a raft going down the river, it just kind of bangs into whatever it hits along the way. Hormones don't do that. They have a specific target. That's why, you know, if you have diabetes, you can take a shot of insulin and put it anywhere and it goes to where it's going. You don't have to get it into your pancreas. It's actually pretty remarkable. So, aroused, yes, we already learned that that's the name of the hormone and I'll tell you how it came about. So these doctors, I have the longer story in my book because there was some animal activism. They, were, they did their experiments on, on dogs, which was not a wonderful thing in the early 1900s. But when they finally got this concept in 1905 of, wow, here's the way these internal secretions work, they did what doctors do and scientists do. They needed a highfalutin word and they needed one, you know, let's come up with something from Greek. So they went to their friend who was a Cambridge University professor and said, what's a word for to arouse? And they were thinking, I mean, I don't know what you're thinking, but what they were thinking aroused meant is arousing your adrenal gland, arousing your pancreas, exciting other glands in the body. He intentionally didn't mention the testes and ovaries in his first talk because he didn't want people to think he was one of those wacky, like, sex libido kind of guys, but he knew it was part of the whole system. So his friends said, well, the word harmoa is Greek for to arouse. Why don't you go with that? And he gave his first talk and said, like, he really just kind of threw it out. He said, hormones, as we may call them. And it kind of stuck. But again, because there's scientists and scientists like to debate, there was someone else that said, what about autocoid? Which is kind of cool, because that means internal drug, which is kind of like what your hormones are. But then we'd be saying, oh my God, I feel so autocoidal. And that sounds so, <laughs> that just sounds weird. But then maybe if we've been saying that for 100 years, it wouldn't sound so weird. I'm gonna show a video about the rooster experiment. I want you guys to appreciate that the, this video was made by two of my undergraduate students. They do not have any film background. <laughs> they did this on an iPad. And the reason why they did it was I had this extracurricular activity and students could do whatever and these two students did this amazing, not this amazing video, they did another amazing video and I waited till the semester was over and I was like, gosh, can you do that for my book? Um, so take that into consideration. One's like,
they both want to be doctors, they're science majors. If any of you are on admissions committees for medical schools, come see me after and I'll give you their names. Um, but I think they've done a wonderful job. So if the sound's a little off or there's a little clickingness, you know, let's just go with that. Welcome to Highlights from Hormone History, a video series inspired by Randy Hutter Epstein's book, Aroused. The subject of this video is the world's first hormone experiment. Learn about it in under three minutes. In 1848, Dr. Arnold Berthold conducted the first genuinely scientific hormone experiment on six roosters in his backyard in Germany. Many scientists then were curious about the testicles, whether they contained vital juices, and how they worked. Could a testicle do its job if it were placed somewhere else in the body? Berthold cut a single testicle off of two of the roosters. He cut both testicles off another two. In the remaining two, he did an odd testicle swapping thing removing both testicles and reinserting one in the belly of the other rooster. Each ended up with another bird's testicle in the wrong place. Here's what Berthold found. The testicle-free birds got fat, lazy, and cowardly. Their brilliant red combs faded and shrank. They stopped chasing female poultry. His unitesticled roosters were the males, or rather the cocks, they had always been. They waddled, puffed their chests, and lusted after the hens. On autopsy, he found the lone testicle swollen. He reckoned it had swelled to compensate for the missing one. But the most stunning finding of all, the discovery that should have shocked the testicle research world, was the result of the gonad switching. Berthold had wondered whether testicles could function from anywhere in the body. They did. He had implanted a testicle between the intestinal loops of a fat, lazy, castrated bird. The young rooster, only three months old, had nothing between his drumsticks but a lone testicle in his gut. Yet he turned back into a full-fledged hen chaser, red comb and all. Berthold repeated his testicle-to-belly switch with another bird, and the same thing happened. Berthold had assumed that when he carved his poultry, he would find a network of nerves connecting the displaced testicles to the body. Instead, he found the testicles were surrounded by blood vessels. He wrote up the first explanation of how hormones work, writing that his experiment showed that the testes released a substance into the blood that was carried off to the rest of the body and reached a special destination. He was right. Hormones are released in one part of the body and reach a specific target like a well-aimed arrow from a bow. He didn't use the word hormone because it wouldn't be coined for another half century. No one listened. The specialty of hormonal science could have started right then and there, but it didn't. Berthold's backyard rooster trial could have been the paradigm-changing experiment, transforming the way scientists looked at internal secretions. He published his insights. Then, without fanfare, he moved on to other projects. As Albert Q. Maisel wrote in The Hormone Quest, it was if Columbus had discovered America and then went home to spend the rest of his life studying the streets of Madrid. Thanks for watching. I love that. I'm so proud of them. I'm so proud of them. Um, but one of the things I like to point out about the um, rooster experiment is that with how many people are scientists in the audience? Okay, so you probably know this better than I do, that to be a great scientist, you know, most of us non-scientists, and I put myself in the non-scientist category, we think you have to be smart enough to answer the question correctly. But that's part of it, because you do have to answer it quite correctly. But the best scientists know the questions. And so that's where I think this rooster guy came along because I don't know, like, what, what even came through his brain to think would a gland work no matter where you put it. I mean, that's actually phenomenal. That is the basis to hormone research. He didn't then understand the ramifications that much to really publicize it. But it's a fascinating question, and it kind of makes you appreciate, oh, that's how science works. It's the guys that know how to ask, the, and the gals, sorry about that. I meant it for all. It's the humans that know how to ask the right questions. So um, 
Because we heard about my grandma a lot, I want to tell you a few other stories. And bear with me a bit, because I want to read you a few pages from my book. It's just the beginning of a chapter. It's going to sound like it has nothing to do with endocrinology, but I promise you it does. On May 21st, 1924, two Chicago teenagers tried to get away with murder. Nathan Leopold, or Babe as he was called, was 19. Richard Dicky Loeb was 18. They were both students at the University of Chicago, born and raised nearby in one of the most exclusive neighborhoods in town. That afternoon, they left their college campus, rented a car, and drove to the Harvard School, an elite boys' school. Then they waited. The two had schemed for months and thought they had covered every angle to avoid suspicion. They knew, for instance, not to drive Babe's Red Willie's night car. That would be a definite giveaway. So they decided to rent a modest vehicle, choosing a blue one. They also lied to the Leopold's chauffeur, telling him the brakes on the Willie's night needed fixing. That way he wouldn't worry about the rental. They rented the car under a false name, Morton D. Ballard. Their alibi was something to do with carousing all night with drunken girls, and they rehearsed it over and over just to ensure they had the exact same story in the slim chance they were ever questioned. Babe and Dickie were brainy kids. One of them was off to Harvard Law School, but actually if you murder someone, they do have the right to rescind your application, which did happen, spoiler alert. Um, they each had skipped grades and started college by the age of 15. But they were novice killers, so they weren't as thorough as they thought. The boys had a short list of potential candidates, all sons of their parents' wealthy friends. They chose 14-year-old Bobby Franks because he was the last to leave school that day and was alone. They waited for him near the schoolyard and lured him into the car by offering him a ride home so he wouldn't have to walk. Then they drove a few blocks and bludgeoned him to death. The corpse was found in the woods later that evening with a pair of expensive horn-rimmed glasses lying nearby. The cops traced them to a high-end shop that only sold three pairs. One belonged to Babe Leopold. Babe tried to explain it away as a coincidence. He was an avid bird watcher, he said. He'd been in the woods in the same area just a few days before and just could have had his eyeglasses fall just where the body happened to be dumped. The cops didn't buy it. Soon enough, the boys confessed, each claiming the other was the ringleader. The families hired famed defense attorney Clarence Darrow. You probably know that name. He's the lawyer that would go on the following year, not yet, to defend John Scopes, the teacher who was sued by the state of Tennessee for teaching evolution. For the Leopold Loeb case, Darrow turned to science too. His mission was not to prove the boys' innocence. They had pleaded guilty but to get them life sentences instead of the death penalty. This murder, many of you may have heard of, was quickly dubbed the crime of the century. Tabloid reporters went nuts over this one. Newspaper men staked out the home of the Leopolds and Loeb. They packed the courtroom. The case would, years later, be inspire four films, one starring Orson Welles, another directed by Alfred Hitchcock, a few books, some fiction, some nonfiction, and even a play. But the driving question of the newspaper reports and the films and the novel, the question on everyone's mind was this. What compelled these two boys who had it all, education, money, connections, to toss everything away for gruesome adventure? What was the motive? And you can imagine what was going on in the tabloids. Let's see, they blamed the boys for being raised by nannies. They were rich kids, and they said the mothers were inattentive. Obviously, blame the mom. That's always the case. And it was because they were raised by nannies. They said, oh, well, they think the boys were every now and then gay lovers, so that must have been it, because I guess homosexuality leads to murder, or so some of the tabloids thought. They also said, well, you know, they, they were 
criminals all along, and they found out that like one of the boys had stolen from a lemonade stand when he was nine years old. Shockingly, none of these whys and wherefores, not the mothering or the sex or the pilfering, pulled all the puzzling pieces together. But there was one theory that appealed to the doctors, lawyers, and a lay public hungry for a scientific reason to explain deviant behavior. It was this newfangled notion being talked about in medical journals and newspapers and medical meetings. The answer lay in the science of endocrinology. Endocrinology really exploded in the 1920s from an obscure science to one of the most popular. There was so much quackery around, and you have to understand what was going on in this 1920s time. So on the quackery side, there was a guy in Kansas who became phenomenally wealthy, and I would like to say a billionaire, but I'm sure he wasn't, and if my husband were here, he'd be like, no, he wasn't a billionaire in the 1920s, but he, he was super, super rich and like had a Rolls Royce and had like a gold plated thing around his house. Um, <laughs> He also bought his medical license in Italy, which you could do then, you can't do that anymore. So without any experience or ever working on a patient or seeing anything, he came back to Kansas, got a farm of goats, and he basically got some celebrities, because that's always a good way to sort of promote your new cause, is to get a celebrity to you know, come. Some say, oh, it does work. So he got actually the publisher of the LA Times. It's good to get media involved. And basically he said, choose your pair of balls, and you could go choose a goat, which testicle you wanted, and in his kitchen, from someone who had never practiced medicine, or actually, he did practice medicine, he just never learned how to do it, um, <laughs> he would do operations in his kitchen and implant goat testicles into you. Um, and there was only a few deaths, only a few deaths, but he, um, and he doesn't, I mean, he didn't keep notes, so there might have been infections, but all these men were saying they never felt better, their libido went up, so this was going on in the 1920s. There was also other kind of cures. I found, um, I found a menopause cure. Actually, it was to cure everything from menopause, from men menstruation cramps to menopause, cancer, constipation, like a whole, anything that could go wrong in your life. And, but if you look at the ingredients, it was like a bottle of gin with a label that said cures everything. It probably actually did take, I do think as I'm drinking, I do think that a good gin martini probably does take the edge off menopause. Um, but I don't think you should sell it in a bottle with all those health claims. Um, but the one person I want you to know about, because I think it's not always easy to separate like the good guys and the bad guys. There was a guy called Lewis Berman and I guess he would be, if he were alive today, he'd have his own television show and a million, no, a billion, a billion Twitter followers. <laughs> Berman was, an, he had the credentials. He was an associate professor at Columbia. He was a member of all the elite medical societies. He published a slew of scientific articles. He also isolated the parathyroid glands, and those are the ones that regulate calcium. So he did a lot of good stuff. But I guess, and I'm just, I'm just postulating, maybe when he started to get attention for the parathyroid glands, he was like, wow, I really like this attention. I haven't read that he said that, but somehow he decided he loved self-promotion and he loved getting attention. So he kind of extrapolated. He used his credentials to go a little farther. And he said that he could know your hormone type just by looking at you. And he went back in history and he said like Abe Lincoln was a very pituitary type of guy. Oscar Wilde, a very thymus type. He went to a prison and he studied the prisoners and he came up with these categories like rapists have too much thymus and murderers have too much pituitary. And so he had all these lists. And his idea was, I think he did believe in all this. It drove, as you can imagine, it drove other scientists and doctors crazy. He wrote books about this and they became the best sellers. He wrote things on like change your behavior with hormones. And remember, this is before you could even measure hormones. He had this idea that he could, oh, he would give you diets. You could, he would give you a special diet that's good for your hormones. Gee, that's not a new idea, guess what? Um, he also promoted things like, um, he said that women who had irregular periods 
obviously lacked female hormones and would become manly, or as he put it, quote, aggressive, dominating, and get this for scary, even enterprising and pioneering. (laughs) That's a woman that needed help. His idea was to go, and he was well-loved by women. Margaret Sanger, the birth control expert, loved him and thought he was the greatest guy. Um, He also thought that we should go into schools and diagnose hormone imbalances when we couldn't measure them at like fourth and fifth grade, like nine and 10 year olds. And that way we would prevent any immoral behavior. We'd prevent murders, we'd prevent crime. And he also had this idea of what he called the ideal normal, which would be someone who was tall, handsome, never needed to sleep and overly intelligent. <laughs> he also said every criminal should be, should be examined for a hormone imbalance. So that is precisely what went on during this trial. Lewis Berman didn't come out. He was in New York, although he did travel to Europe with Ezra Pound and James Joyce, and he went there, but he wasn't going to Chicago. But Clarence Darrow hired two other people who considered themselves hormone experts. And they came in June 1924 to the jail where these kids were, and they spent a few days interviewing them, They had x-rays, because you couldn't measure hormones, but they'd x-ray your head, and if like your bones near the pituitary gland was splayed too much, it, it, it implied that the pituitary was too big. They also brought something, and I can't even pronounce this word, it's something that measures your metabolism, a metalometer, a metabolometer, I think I'm leaving out a syllable, but you get it, like a metabolism measurer. And it looked like, I have a picture of it, not here, there was, I saw a picture of it, it looked like what's in my boiler room, like a big thing. Um, at the end of it, these two doctors came up with a 300 page, 80,000 word report. I'm not gonna read the whole thing tonight. <laughs> but I'll just tell you what they said in like six words. Um, They said that babe Leopold had a calcified pineal gland. Now we know that has to do with your circadian rhythms, but in those days they thought it had to do with your moral or your inhibitions or something with morality. Dickie Loeb, they said, had multiglandular disorder. In other words, there was like a hell of a lot wrong with him. The judge, there wasn't a trial because this was just a judge that was determining the sentencing. The judge said, and I'm gonna paraphrase because I'm not good with legal ease, but the judge said something along these lines. This is fascinating. The science of endocrinology, it's new, it was basically brand new in the 1920s, is fascinating. I love what you're talking about, brains and behavior and chemistry. I'm loving this. But it's not gonna get these two murderers off the hook. So they didn't get death sentences, but he said that has nothing to do with all this science. It's because they were young. But they each, got, um, they each got a life sentence, and they each got a life sentence plus 99 years for kidnapping this kid. Dickie Loeb was murdered nine months later in prison. And actually, just say within those nine months, both of these boys were so charismatic. There were in wall, it was like under, there were women from all over the America writing like love letters to them. Um, Nathan Leopold, like the good psychopath he was, but we didn't think about that then, was released after 34 years as a mob because he was on good behavior. He was the model prisoner. Um, he got out. He went to Puerto Rico. He became a medical technician because those are the kind of people we want in the medical field. Um, he married Trudy Feldman, a doctor's widow. He died in 1971, to me that's not that long ago, and donated his body to science. But we'll never know, like I don't know, like it would be like, you know, you would think they'd be like, oh, now let's look at his glands. But by the time he died in 1971, endocrinology morphed into a completely different field. And I just think that like no one remembered who he was and he just ended up like on a first year medical student's anatomy table. Now I want to go to a real scientist. So you heard a little bit about her. That is Rosalind Yallow. And um, has anyone, did anyone hear that name before the trivia? Oh, good. So we have one person. You heard about her? 
I love that. I mean, I think she should be like a well-known name. And I'm, I'm kind of friendly through email with her son and daughter now. And I've met so many people that worked with her. Um, and a lot of people that worked with her said she was like a real tough cookie. I don't think she was a warm and cuddly kind of mom. But when you know her story, you can appreciate it. I just, I have such respect for her. So she was this poor girl from New York. Her parents were immigrants, uneducated, but they wanted her to be educated. She went to Hunter College, public, uh, the public college in New York, graduated tops in her class in physics. And then she said to her teacher, I love this, this is what I wanna do, I wanna be a scientist, and her teacher did say, it wasn't a joke what we heard before. Her teacher said, you know, this is the 1940s, or maybe her teacher didn't say that, but she did say this, you should become a secretary to a scientist. And so she did, she had no other options. So she became a secretary to a scientist at Columbia University, and she only looked for university jobs because she knew then she could take free courses. And then she would take, I mean, she wasn't thinking one day I'll be a Nobel Prize winner. She was just wanted to learn science for the hell of it. So she started working for this Dr. Columbia and said, um, I'd love to use my free time to take these free classes in science. And he said to her, you know, it doesn't really make sense. Why don't you take stenography? So I don't think she ever did that. Then she sort of dug her heels in, and then she really started, well, actually, this is what happened. Her son told me, um, like he said, my mom had no sense of humor, zero zilch. But I think she did, because she said to the guy that wrote her biography, who happened to be a, her underling, she trained him, a scientist, she said, they had to have a world war so I could get into graduate school. <laughs> And it's true, there were two openings, one at Purdue, one at University of Illinois. Purdue called, just because there was not enough men to fill the slots, it was the early 1940s. Purdue called Hunter and said, she's a Jew, she's a woman. Can you guarantee you'll give her a job after? And Hunter said, well, we can't guarantee. So they said, okay, so they rescinded that offer. University of Illinois took her. Um, she got all A's, one A minus, and her, the dean called her in and pointed to the A minus and said, that's why we don't like having women in our program. Um, she did get a job after. Um, she graduated. She actually got her PhD a year before her husband. She came back to New York. She got a job um, at the Bronx VA. Her husband got a job. She, it took her a while. Her husband got a job. And someone just told me recently um, that he knew Rosalind and he knew her, she and her husband. And she had so much trouble. No one wanted to hire her even after she got a PhD. So the story goes, she finally got a, she finally got a job in the Bronx. And I think that they gave her a lab that was like a janitor's closet and was just kind of like, here, use that space, which she did. Um, and now I get into it in the book and I'm not going to go into details here, but I think I, I think I really um, explain this in a fun way. She and her colleague Solomon Burson developed radio immunoassay. And it's really the basis for what we use for everything now, for those of you who got it right on the trivia. What they did was they figured out a way to measure hormones. It was, con it was thought that hormones were too scarce to measure. But this same technique is the exact same one to measure anything we think is too scarce. So that's why on the trivia contest, yes, we wouldn't have been able to isolate HIV. We wouldn't have the whole fertility field. You wouldn't be able to do cancer markers. You wouldn't be able to do drug testing. Anything that we just sort of did, you know, that we just took for granted that you couldn't measure now is measurable. But it's, it's really incredible to think about this. So before Yalow and Burson, it wasn't like we could sort of measure hormones. You didn't measure them at all. So you were a kid, let's say, in the 1950s, and I do write about a kid like this in my book, who in the late 1950s, they worried that he was growth hormone deficient. And he went to a doctor, he went to the top doctor, and she did diagnose him with growth hormone deficiency, but she never measured his growth hormone. Same as like if they thought you were deficient in thyroid or anything, there were treatments but it was really guesswork. And then all of a sudden, after this radio immunoassay, what was guesswork became a really precise science. Someone had mentioned that they could patent this. I mean, think about it, it's extraordinary when they did this. And Yala was like, that's ridiculous. Why would you wanna patent something that's so important that everyone should be able to do? 
Um, so she just, anyone came, like all these people from all over were coming to the Bronx to learn the technique. So it really took off very, very quickly. There's a lot of brilliant and compassionate scientists and doctors that have been and are doing now wonderful research. They are planting the seeds that are growing into strong trees. That's helping us understand how our bodies work in never ways that we in ways that we never thought possible. And this is paving the way for treatments and potential cures. And yet, ever since the story of hormones began, there have also been those grabbing at the low-lying fruit. They take these hints from research and they extrapolate them way, way, way too far. Some of them intentionally, some of them not intentionally. Some of them preying off our fears and our desires so they can market all this hormone therapy. My hope is when you read the book, you'll be able to appreciate who the heroes are and who the hucksters are and appreciate that even some of the brilliant people made mistakes along the way. So I write about Harvey Cushing, and he would be called in the hero category, and he did some amazing work and really, really showed the brain-body connection and hormones for the first time. If anyone's heard his name, it's probably because he's considered the first effective neurosurgeon, which he did, but he also did a ton of other things. Like, he was an amazing artist. He decided, oh, I'll take a year off of medicine and write a book, and he got a Pulitzer. Like, you'd probably be so annoyed to have him around because he was, always did everything the best. And he also was a pioneer in endocrinology. Um, the thing he did... Most of what he did was absolutely amazing. And if anyone wants to come to Yale, we have his 600 collection, bought jars of brains. He kept everyone's brain that he operated on because they died shortly thereafter. Um, <laughs> but they didn't die right away. People before him were dying on the operating room table. Um, and now we have this beautiful brain room that I love to go in, and it shows his images and, um, and its brain. So... Um, it's probably the only reason why you want to go to New Haven because the pizza's overrated, but the Cushing brains... Oh, oh, I teach there. I, what, or did you go to Yale? I don't know. Uh, well, I, I mean, I teach there, so I'm there. So I can shit on I can shit on my own place. I can shit on my own place. <laughs> and, and New York City has better pizza. <laughs> Not in Portland from New Haven, but the Cushing brain room's amazing, amazing. Okay? Yeah. So anyhow, but the Cushing Brain Room's an amazing thing. I'll take anybody around if you show up. I'll even buy you a good drink in New Haven. There is great cocktails there now. Um, but even Cushing made mistakes. So he did all this phenomenal stuff that you can read about, but he also made a mistake because he was so into the pituitary that there was this 48-year-old man that had a pituitary tumor that he diagnosed and treated. And then he thought, and again, maybe if it worked, he would have been considered a genius for that too. He thought... Well, what if I remove this entire pituitary from the guy and just give him a fresh new one to start off? So he thought, what I need is a pituitary from a dead baby. So, um, so he talked to an OBGYN friend and he said, next time you have a dead baby, can I have the pituitary? And you didn't have to ask permission for anyone in those days. So his friend called and was like, yep, whenever your friend called, I have the dead baby. Cushing sent his medical student over to get the pituitary. He implanted this baby pituitary gland in this 48-year-old man's brain. Um, he was famous by then, Cushing, so he let it be new. He, you know, the media, you can imagine, it was like baby brain cures man. You know, broken brain fixed with baby brain. Um, and the man did survive, because you can go, you can survive with a defective pituitary for a while. So the man lived another couple months later. He started to deteriorate. Cushing um, then tried it again. He got another dead baby brain, dead baby pituitary gland, implanted it, and then the man died shortly thereafter. Um, Cushing was amazing in many ways, but he wasn't humble and he wasn't one to admit his mistakes. So he blamed the medical student um, for not getting the brain, to not getting the pituitary to him fast enough. He blamed the OBGYN for not, for like being sloppy about taking it out of the brain, but he didn't do any more of those experiments. So I just want to um, go over a few th things that I touch on in the book, what we know and what we don't know. Um, 
Transgender, I write about transgender. I write about one of my friends who transitioned. There's a lot going on with children now. I, I spoke to a lot of children, parents of children. I tell my friend's story um, because he's so articulate. And I think while we know that children are going, or there's many children that identify as transgender, I thought to hear from an adult look back on their life um, would just give a much better perspective. There's many advances now for children who identify as transgender. The laws have recent, not the laws, like the guidelines have recently changed. I'm not sure, I think doctors have changed before the guidelines came out. It used to be in the US that you could not offer children therapy till at least they were 16. So now they're saying there's no set age of when you can start therapy. It's a very individual thing from doctor and patient. Um, we're trying to make these kids happy. It's a really tough thing. What they thought was like a huge advance. You could give kids, um, before puberty, you can give kids puberty blockers up until they're really sure they wanna go through a transition. But even that's not a wonderful thing because Picture, you know, you're 18 and 6, 17, and you still look prepubescent. So that doesn't help so much either. And that's why a lot of the doctors that are treating these children have pushed to have the guidelines say, like, let's start treating them earlier. You're going to see stories pop up in the news that seem to come up, like, every now and then that say, oh, new study shows brains of transgender people look more like the gender they want to be or they feel more like than the identity at birth. Truth of the matter is, if you gave a brain, two brains to a scientist and cut them in half and said, look at them, they wouldn't be able to pick the girl brain from the boy brain. So I'm not quite sure how those studies are done because we're not really good at, you know, at, at looking at brains and saying, oh, that's your gender identity. What scientists think is that during embryo embryonic development, at six weeks, a hormone called anti-malarian hormone kicks in, and it sort of drives, that will drive boy, the, the sort of male-looking anatomy and prevent the female-looking anatomy, and that sort of puts, you know, before that, we all kind of look alike. What scientists think is that's also the time where there's hormones affecting the brain. What exactly is going on, we don't know yet. But doctors do think that yes, there is that there are that people with a, with who identify as transgender know down to their core that how they feel inside is not how they look on the outside. It's very contentious now, also because among the transgender community, rightly so, they're very reluctant in some ways for this science to advance forward. Although it will advance forward, because they're so worried that one day they're going to go to a doctor's office and the doctor will say, oh. Let me, do a, let me draw blood and see if you really are feeling this way. So it, it's a, it's, we're at a very sort of contentious phase now. Um, but there are, the good news is, there's more and more centers opening up, so there's more and more help for people that feel this way. Hormones and hunger. I talk about hormones and hunger in the book. The good news is, for some people, um, and we talked about leptin in the trivia contest, um, the good news is that for a small group of people who have a defect in leptin, it means, and there's other defects they can have too, and I spend time with a family that I write about, these people are voraciously hungry all the time, insatiably hungry. They don't even really enjoy food, they're just compelled to keep eating it. From a scientific point of view, the scientists have said the fascinating thing about this is it really shows hormones controlling behavior. This has nothing to do with burning calories or putting on weight. This has to do with feeling compelled to eat. Um, yes, you can order, I've seen it, a leptin diet book. I think you can either get like candies or something in the mail. I'm sorry, if you don't have this specific defect, it's not gonna help getting a few little leptin shots. It's not gonna curb your appetite because this is gonna really shock all of you out there. Sometimes we eat even when we're not hungry. <laughs> so actually taking something that claims to control your hormone hunger, and I don't know, like if you're giving a talk the next day and you're in a town that has good ice cream, you might just be like, I'm so full, but let's do it. Let's get the ice cream. <laughs> Menopause. I talk a lot about menopause in the book, and I talk more vaginas in like an all 
female audience, um, and no one wants to hear that that much, but here's your fun fact I'll leave you with. Some scientists believe that the only other animal that goes through menopause is the killer whale. <laughs> I've been through menopause, and I felt like a killer whale at time, and I thought, that makes sense, I get it. I do write about hormone replacement therapy and what we should know and what we know now. Um, testosterone, just I wanna make this fair on what we talk about and what we don't. Testosterone, so here's what I'll say. Yeah, I go in and I watched, I watched a bunch of like sports shows just so I could see all the testosterone ads. Um, <laughs> I spoke to the doctor that came up with, I don't know if you guys know, there's like a, a four question survey that you can take to figure out if you're low T. One of the questions is, are you tired at the end of the day at work? <laughs> if yes, you might be low testosterone, or you might just be human. Try that, try that. You actually might just be human. So, and the doctor told me, oh yeah, I did that study. He got paid for it, and I did it while I was sitting on the toilet. That's what he told me. Um, but it's still used. It's called the Adam Questionnaire. A-D-A-M stands for like something with like androgynous deficiency something something. Um, but here's the thing. There are people that really are low testosterone, and when they're given testosterone, they do, it does boost their libido, and it makes you stronger, it makes you feel better. So if you go from low to normal, yes, you will feel the difference. There's a big zone of normal, like the way we usually calculate, it's like in, um, it's um, nanograms per deciliter, so like the numbers between 300 and 900 are considered the normal range. If you go from 400 to 500, you know, it might make you feel better, but it doesn't really do anything. None of the studies work that makes a difference. But here's the important thing. If you're thinking, oh, maybe I should get my testosterone checked, go to someone who knows endocrinology. How about that? Or go to a urologist or someone that's studied or go to a doctor that's actually studied endocrinology. You don't want to go to a doctor that sends their labs off to a supplement making place. And that's real. That actually does happen. You actually want to have two blood tests sent to an accredited lab. There's this big movement of angry scientists and they should be angry that are pushing it. They have something called PATH. And I forgot what the acronym stands for, but it's like... Let's just get some decent labs out there. And so there are, and they want to separate the good guys and the bad guys. So, you know, getting a lab test, and the scientists out there know this, if you get a lab test, it's not like you're putting money into a soda machine and then it spits out the results. There's actually humans that do all this stuff in a lab, so you want a good one, and you want them to analyze your labs properly. So how do you know? You can go on the CDC website and look, but I always think just asking. Like, if you say, oh, where are you sending the labs off to? And if they say, oh, right here, we're at a university, I'm just gonna send it right here, that's a good sign. You know, if they say, oh, know this place that also makes testosterone and supplements and we just send it there and they send your supplements back with the results then that's and that's actually a true thing that's actually not a great thing to do um okay one more fun fact so we hear a lot about pheromones have you guys heard about those or the other thing is like ecto hormones you know hormones are inside pheromones are the things that like the chemicals that we all exude it's like it's like why apparently, if you believe in them, and they don't work in humans, but apparently, like, one could say, like, sometimes I drive my husband crazy. Like, no one infuriates my husband more than I do, and we've been together for now, oh, 38 years or something. But, um, but it's chemistry that probably keeps us together. Actually, it's not really true. I mean, I think it's gotta be. It's that. It's something. Um, but it's not my pheromones, which I'd like to think. But here's the thing, because we don't have what some other species do. But if you are single and female and a silkworm moth, do we have any of them out here today? <laughs> any in the audience? If you are you, actually, and I can't really see you guys, well, you don't have to shine the light because I won't be able to see a silkworm moth anyhow. But if you are single and female and a silkworm moth out there, I just wanna let you know this. You can get your guy whenever you want. You can actually spray a pheromone. It's like a hormone that leaves you. 
and any male silkworm nearby will turn into a sex slave. One whiff, and he follows that scent trail back and will mount you. <laughs> it is just such a wonderful, divine mechanism of female manipulation <laughs> that we're still working on. Um, but for humans, but we haven't gotten there yet. I want to end with just one quote. So getting back to Rosalind Yellow, because even though people have said to me, I've worked with her, she was so tough, she was kind of nasty. If she didn't think you were smart enough, she didn't give you the time of day. And I just kind of feel like saying, you know what? Like, after what she went through, she deserved to be really tough. She was told to become a secretary, got the Nobel. So there was all these rumors, like people said, you know, after she got the Nobel, she signed every letter, like Rosin Yellow Nobel Laureate. I'm like, okay. Like, think about how we sign. We all have addresses under our names on email that have like our like nothing little titles. And so if you win the Nobel, you can actually, like I would, I would just write Nobel Laureate all the time under my name. And she did that. But her kids were like, oh, I don't think she always did that. And then apparently she always wore her gold Nobel prize. Um, which was in the picture that I showed you. And her kids also said, no, she didn't do that. But this is what she did do. Her kids said, this is true. Behind her desk, she had this sign. To be considered half as good as a man, a woman must work twice as hard and be twice as good. So that you're all like, you're kind of nodding like, oh, that's nice, we've heard of that. But Rosalind Yellow, the woman who supposedly did not have a sense of humor, added this. <laughs> The slide says, fortunately, that's not difficult. We like her. So I, I love closing on that quote because I like just having that up there. And I'm happy to um, take questions. Thank you for listening. This podcast and Science on Tap are created by Via Productions, and we're based in Portland, Oregon, in the U.S. If you want to find out more about how to go to one of our events, check out our website at scienceontaporwa.org. And that last part stands for Oregon and Washington. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at scienceontaporwa. As always, I want to say thank you to my volunteers who help me run these events and who are amazing and fun people as well. They are Scott Fry, Chris Gowan, Sam Lauk, Rita Nigren, and Steve Perry, as well as many other people. I'd also like to say thank you to Amber Peoples for stepping in and for running things for the past few months. A final thank you to Jonathan Colton for letting us use his song Mandelbrot Set as our intro and outro music. Just in time to save